Overcoming Death, Part 2 Death After Our Work Is Finished Unless a Christian plainly knows his work is finished, and he no longer is required by the Lord to remain, he should by all means resist death. If the symptoms of death have been seen already in his body, before his work is done, he positively should resist it and its symptoms. He should believe that the Lord will undertake in what he has resisted, for he has work for him yet to do. Hence, before our appointed task is discharged, we can trust in the Lord restfully, even in the face of dangerous physical signs. In cooperating with the Lord and resisting death, we will soon see him work towards the swallowing up of it, that is, death, by his life. Notice how the Lord Jesus resisted the jaws of death. When people tried to push him down a cliff, he passed through the midst of them and went his way. On one occasion, Jesus went about in Galilee, but he would not go about in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. On another occasion, the Jews took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why did he thrice resist mortality? Because his time had not yet come. He knew there was an appointed hour for the Messiah to be cut off, he could not die in advance of God's appointed moment, nor could he die at any other place than at Golgotha. We too must not die before our time. The Apostle Paul likewise had the experience of resisting death. The powers of darkness pressed for his premature departure, yet he overcame them in each instance. Once when he was imprisoned with death as the possible outcome, he confessed as follows. If it is to be life in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul was not afraid to die. Nevertheless, before the work was done, he knew by faith in God he would not die. This was his victory over death. And towards the end, when he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, he also knew that the time of his departure had come. Before our race is fully run, we must not die. Peter knew the time of his departure, too. I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. To concede, by sizing up of our environment, physical condition, and feeling that our time has come, is an error on our part. We instead need to possess definite indications from the Lord. As we live for him, so must we die for him. Any call for departure which does not come from the Lord ought to be opposed. In reading the Old Testament, we find that all the patriarchs died full of years. What is meant by this phrase? It means they totally lived out the days appointed them by God. God has appointed each of us a particular age. If we do not live to that age, we have not conquered death. How are we to know the span appointed us? The Bible offers a general yardstick. The years of our life are threescore and ten, or even by reason of strength, fourscore. Now we are not suggesting that everybody must live to be at least seventy, for we cannot encroach on God's sovereignty like that. But in case we receive no registration of a shorter period, let us accept this number as standard and repulse any earlier departure. By standing on the word of God, we will see victory. This next section is no fear in death. In speaking of overcoming death, we do not mean to imply that our body shall never die. Though we believe we shall not all sleep, yet to say that we will not die is superstitious. Since the Bible suggests the common span of life as 70 years of age, we can expect to live that long if we have faith. But we cannot hope to live forever because of the Lord Jesus is our life. 
We know God frequently has his exceptions. Some die before the age of 70. Our faith can only ask God that we do not leave before our task is finished. Whether our life be long or short, we cannot perish like sinners before half our appointed days are over. Our years should be sufficient enough to accomplish our life's work. Then, when the end does come, we can depart peacefully with the grace of God upon us, as naturally as the falling of a fully ripened melon. The book of Job describes such a departure in this manner. You shall come to your grave in a ripe old age, as a shock of grain comes up to the threshing floor in its season. Overcoming death does not necessarily mean no grave, for God may wish some to overcome it through resurrection, just as our Lord Jesus did. In passing through death, believers, like their Lord, need to have no fear of it. If we seek to overcome the jaws of death because we are afraid or unwilling to die, we already are defeated. It may be that the Lord will save us from death altogether by rapturing us alive to heaven. We nonetheless should not ask for his speedy return out of a fear of mortality. Such apprehensiveness shows that we are defeated already by death. Let us come to see that even should we go to the grave, we are merely walking from one room to another room. There is no justification for unbearable inward pain, fear, and trembling. We originally were those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. The Lord Jesus, however, has set us free, and therefore we fear it no more. Its pain, darkness, and loneliness cannot frighten us. An apostle who had experienced victory over death testified that to die is gain. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Not a wrinkle of fear could be detected there. The victory over death was actual and complete. Okay, here's the third way that believers can overcome death, by being raptured alive. We know that at the return of the Lord Jesus, many will be raptured alive. This is the last way of overcoming death. Both 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 discuss this way. We realize there is no set date for the Lord's coming. He could have come at any time during the past 20 centuries. Hence, believers always could cherish the hope of being raptured without passing through the grave. Since the coming of the Lord Jesus is currently much nearer than before, our hope of being raptured alive is greater than that of our predecessors. We do not wish to say too much, but these few words we can safely affirm. Namely, should the Lord Jesus come in our time, would we not want to be living so as to be raptured alive? If so, then we must overcome death, not letting ourselves die before our appointed hour, so that we may be raptured alive. According to the prophecy of Scripture, some believers shall be raptured without going through death. To be thus raptured constitutes one more kind of victory over death. As long as we remain alive on earth, we cannot deny that we may be the ones to be so raptured. Should we not therefore be prepared to overcome death completely? Perhaps we will die. Nonetheless, we are not necessarily under any obligation to do so. The words the Lord Jesus variously proclaimed make this teaching crystal clear. On the one hand, our Lord asserted, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. On the other hand, yet on the same occasion, Jesus also affirmed this, This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. What the Lord is saying is that among those who believe in him, some will die and be raised up, while others will not pass through death at all. The Lord Jesus expressed this view at the death of Lazarus. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Here the Lord is not only the resurrection, but also the life. However, most of us believe in him as the resurrection, yet forget that he also is the life. We readily admit that he will raise us up after we die. But do we equally acknowledge that he, because he is our life, is able to keep us alive? The Lord Jesus explains to us his two kinds of work, yet we only believe in one. Believers throughout these 20 centuries shall have experienced the Lord's word that he who believes in me, though he die, 
yet shall he live. Certain others shall enjoy in the future his other word that whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Thousands and thousands of believers already have departed in faith, but God says some shall never die. Not some shall never be raised again, but some shall never die. Consequently, we have no reason to insist that we first must die and subsequently be resurrected. Since the coming of the Lord Jesus is nigh, why should we die beforehand and wait for the resurrection? Why not expect the Lord to come and rapture us, that we may be delivered totally from the power of death? The Lord indicates he will be resurrection to many, but also life to some. Marvelous though it is to be raised from the dead, as was the experience of Lazarus, this by no means exhausts the way of victory over death. The Lord has another method. Never die. We are appointed to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. On the other hand, God has erected a floating bridge for us that we might go directly to heaven. This floating bridge is the rapture. The time of the rapture is drawing near. If anyone desires to be raptured alive, he here and now must learn how to overcome death. Before rapture, the last enemy must be overcome. On the cross, the Lord Jesus entirely overcame that enemy. Today, God wants his church to experience this victory of Christ. We all sense that we are living in the end time. The Holy Spirit is presently leading us to wage the last battle with death before the rapture comes. I'm going to end this video here, and we'll pick up the last section on the third video.